Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this kind of gucky morning, but outside, inside here, it's great. It's warm, it's bright, <clears throat> a lot of fellowship. It's good to have you guys here. There are a number of announcements that I want to make. Uh, reminders to check out the Dates to Remember section, which has stuff on our Bible studies, on Bob's activities in the care center. I wanted to remind folks the vision team is on a short hiatus while we pursue another avenue of restoring to restoring our health. Um, please make sure you fill out the survey for helping with healing, either online or on paper. Just ask Bob uh, or myself. We'll get you the information you need for doing the survey. And if you can get others that don't attend here uh, currently, particularly those that are on the membership roll still, uh, to fill out that survey, it would be very, very helpful. Next Sunday, Pauline's preaching. Bob and I will provide some special music. And her title is Resurrection Life Now. So I'm looking forward to hearing that as she preaches on the theme of All Saints Day uh, and from those scriptures. And lastly, I would remind you that the service for Gene Hamilton is next Saturday, October 30th at 11 a.m. Visitation is scheduled for 10 a.m. And then there'll be a fellowship downstairs following the graveside service. So we'll have the service in here. We'll go do the committal over at the graveside, which takes only a couple minutes. And then, well, he has full military honor, so it'll take a bit longer. And then uh, we'll have the reception here. And I'm sure that, you, that the ladies are already hard at work or planning what's going to be done for Saturday. If not, who should I tell them to contact? Terry, you? Me, Doris, or whoever. It's, it's all... You, Doris, or whoever. Yeah. So, okay. Are there any other announcements we need to make at this time? This is a totally secular announcement. <clears throat> Excuse me, but if anyone should be having today or tomorrow when it's raining going south on 61, south Minneapolis, the first cut over to the new road is low. And there is a big puddle there that if you hit it at speed will starve you at the very least. So just take care. The others, not so much, but that first one is not well designed. And it's kind of danger when it's raining. <laughs> So that's south of Minneapolis. First cut over south of Minneapolis. Well, that's good. Well, they don't have good for us. They don't have any north yet, but this is when it cuts from the old road over to the new road. Yeah. And this one is just too low, and water is ponding there. But I don't have to worry about it when I'm going to Minneapolis after the service. So. Any other announcements? Thank you for the safety announcement there. Since I know a lot of you go to Burlington. <laughs> any, any other announcements at this time? If not, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Wow. <laughs> Very good. Please stand and read responsibly the call to worship as it's written in your bulletins. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. God's love surrounds us every day. Our God is merciful and gracious. Turn your backs upon idols. Worship the Holy One of Israel. Blessed are all who stand in awe before God. Happy are all who walk in His ways. The love of God has chosen us. The love of God unites us with all His people. God is our judge and our source of love. God is our comfort and our refuge. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 246, Arise, My Soul, Arise. It's a little tricky. It's new, so I'm going to play it all the way through for you. seated. Please join me in reading responsive reading number 99 in your Brown Living Bible. I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. I will constantly speak of His glories and grace. I will boast of all His kindness to me. Let all who are discouraged take heart. Let us praise the Lord together and exalt His name. For I cried to Him, and He answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Others, too, were radiant at what He did for them. There was no downcast look of rejection. This poor man cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. For the angel of the Lord guards and rescues all who reverence him. O oh, put God to the test, and see how kind he is. See for yourself the way his mercy showered down on all who trust in him. 
you belong to the Lord, reverence him, for everyone who does this has everything he needs. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those of us who reverence the Lord will never lack any good thing. Sons and daughters, come and listen and let me teach you the importance of trusting and fearing the Lord. Do you want a long, good life? Then watch your tongue. Keep your lips from lying. Turn from all known sin and spend your time doing good. Try to live in peace with everyone. Work hard at it. For the eyes of the Lord are intently watching all who live good lives. And he gives attention when they cry to him. Yes, the Lord hears the good man when he calls to him for help and saves him out of all his troubles. As for those who serve the Lord, he will redeem them. Everyone who takes refuge in him will be freely pardoned. Jesus calls us to enter the joy of discipleship, the joy of following in his way. But sin clings closely, and we struggle to respond fully to Christ's invitation. Let us seek God's forgiveness, so that we may know more deeply the joy God intends by reading together the unison prayer of confession, and then by coming silently before the throne of God as individuals. Let us pray. Lord of all, the demands of your righteousness are too hard for us to fulfill alone. So we rush off with this excuse and ignore your law. You forgive our inequity and remember our sin no more. And we abuse this freedom as if it were a license to selfishness, self-indulgement, and self-righteousness. You give us the gift of grace, atonement in the blood of your son yet we make it cheap without serious repentance we fail to see the power of your faithfulness we are your people but do we know you as our god forgive us lord the sins we know in our heart save us lord from the sins we hide god of our refuge and strength have mercy on us right on our hearts Amen. Relentlessly, God seeks us out. With abundant grace and boundless mercy, God seeks us out. This is good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. and prayer for illumination written in your bulletin. Gracious God, illumine these words by your Spirit that we might hear what you would have us hear and be who you would have us be for the sake of Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. Amen. Our first reading today is from Job chapter 42, verses 1 and 6, and then verses 10 and 17. They can be found on pages 841 and 42 in your Pew Bible. Some people find the conclusion of the book of Job somewhat less than satisfying. Job now becomes wealthier than at the beginning and has another ten children. Is that a reward for his having repented? Is it to make up for his suffering? Are his lost sons and daughters so easily replaced? It's not clear what would be a more satisfying ending, however. 
we might like Job to get an explanation for what happened to him. But we just saw in the previous few chapters that the Creator does not owe explanations to those he has created. We might like to see a recognition that the ten additional children do not erase the grief for those who died. But the people of Job's day understood that as well as we do, even if it is not stated in the passage. In the end, like Job, we have to accept that God is beyond our understanding, and all that we receive from Him is a gift. Job 42, 1-6 and 10-17. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought on him, and each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, oxen rather, and a dozen donkeys. A thousand donkeys. Can't read. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. The first daughter he named Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karin Hapach. Nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years. He saw his children and their grandchildren to the fourth generation, and so Job died an old man and full of years. Our second Old Testament reading today is from Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 8 and 19 through 22, and can be found on pages 871 and 72. It is interesting to see that this psalm was written when David had pretended to be insane before Ababakek. Some people today would consider David's claims of, about God to be, if not a bit insane, then at least pretty irrational. Why does David give God credit for saving him out of his troubles, but he doesn't hold God responsible for allowing those troubles to begin with? Besides, didn't David get himself out of trouble by pretending to be insane? David might find such questions to be themselves pretty irrational. God is good, of course. He is to be praised for all the good things he brings into our lives. We don't find out that God is good because he saves us from trouble, but because we know he is good. We can see evidence of it in our lives. Psalm 34, 1-8, 19-22. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Our epistle reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verses 23 to 28, and they can be found on pages 1869 and 70. It can be hard for us who only know about the Levitical priesthood of ancient history to really appreciate the arguments that Hebrews makes about why Jesus is a better high priest. 
But for the original audience, this was an important issue. Were they better off depending on the established tradition of animal sacrifices offered by priests in the temple? Or this relatively new teaching about Jesus having died once and for all for all of their sins? Even if we take it as settled that Jesus is our true great high priest, however, we can learn to appreciate more fully the meaning of what he did for us by learning more about the sacrificial system described in Hebrews. Hebrews 7, 23 to 28. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. I'll be curious after worship, Bob, to know what translation that was. When looking at the scriptures today, it actually was a little difficult to find a common thread that wove throughout them in a teachable manner. They all spend time praising God. They all spend time recognizing the greatness of God, or in the case of Hebrews, Jesus Christ. They all speak of the eternity that resides with God and in God. But it can be, as the liturgist noted, a little difficult to actually understand what God may have intended in the giving of this scriptures. Don't know that I'm going to help a whole lot, but we'll try. Job has been schooled by God for the last four chapters before the one that we read. He has recognized that his Redeemer lives with that famous phrase, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And he comes to God and repents of his complaining and of the pride that fed it. He admits that he is powerless before God. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? That was referring to himself. God asked that question. Therefore I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, or one translation said, things beyond me, which I did not know. And then he says to God, Hear now, and I will speak. 
I will ask you and you instruct me. So he's remembering what God said. And he notes that I have heard you. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. And when they talk about eyes seeing you, uh, it means more, something a little more deep and more intimate than simply, I see you. Just like the word know in the Old Testament and in Hebrew has a much deeper connotation dealing with intimacy, usually between a man and a woman. So too, when he says something like this, but now my eyes see you, it's, I understand you. I've seen your countenance. I've looked into your soul, as it were. He says, therefore I retract and I, what I said, and I repent in dust and ashes. It's interesting that in coming before God... at least in this particular case, it was not the exciting experience you might think. Instead, it made him aware of his unworthiness. There's a song, I think it's by Mercy Me, I could be wrong, called I Can Only Imagine. And it asks that question, what do we do when, when we come face to face to glory, or to the glory of Christ? And one of the things it says, will I fall on my knees? I suspect that's what most of us will do. Even though we love God, we love Jesus Christ, we know He loves us. In that moment when we see Christ face to face, we will come to realize our pure unworthiness to have been saved. We will also recognize in that moment the complete inability of us to save ourselves or to have saved ourselves. Because even now while we say that, I am sure that there's a little part of us the part of us that, as Paul says, is of the flesh, the part of us that wants to run things, the part of us that wants to be self-sufficient, which still says, I must have done something to have gotten this. And we'll realize, no, we didn't. God alone redeemed us for His purposes out of love. Now, the story of Job finishes with those verses there in 10 to 17. And again, with the liturgist, I agree and struggle with for us in the modern setting how unsatisfactory this might be. Many of us might say, who cares if he got things restored twofold? Why didn't he just leave him alone in the first place? He had ten more children. But what about those first ten? And the grief of their loss. I don't think he ever really cared about wealth, based on my reading in Job. But God was showing his favor to those around him by letting them know God blessed him. And boy, he got to live a long time. 140 years after all this, I forgot to go back and look and see if it says how old he was when he started, but he was already enough to have had kids and grandkids and be considered in his golden years. So I suspect he was 
well over 200 when he died. Especially since it says he lived to the fourth generation and got to see it. How many of you have the fourth generation? That's kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and great-great-grandkids. Anybody have great-great-grandkids? I thought we did. There's one. Gives you some idea of how long he lived, the age that he was. And he died an old man full of days. That's a nice ending, but it's a little quiet. What's interesting to me is as much as that blessing of Job's life seems almost over the top, what we're going to get is even better. Despite our sinfulness, despite our shortcomings, despite the fact that we speak often about things that we don't have full knowledge of, despite the fact that we struggle because we don't know God's plan and we see things around us that hurt us and don't appeal to us, frustrate us, we need to recognize who God is and who we are. Now again, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't grieve. This doesn't mean you shouldn't lament. The Bible is full of that. This doesn't mean you shouldn't get angry. Just be sure your anger is properly placed. And as Scripture says, be angry yet don't sin. Don't take it out on those that don't deserve it. Don't fly into a rage and consider simply punishing without considering disciplining. Without considering reconciliation. It requires us sometimes to make a sacrifice. In the old days, they needed to do multiple sacrifices just to meet the standards of the law. You had to do sacrifices for good things. You had to do sacrifices for your family and its future. You had to do sacrifices for personal sin. Even as it notes in Hebrews, the priests, before they could offer sacrifices for your sins, they had to offer sacrifices for their sins. So that they were clean enough to be able to offer the sacrifice for your sins. But Jesus came and died once for all as our high priest. The permanent high priest, the permanent and one and only pure, holy, perfect sacrifice. So what sacrifices then do we need to offer? Well, not for our salvation. We don't need to offer any. And that's the joy that is in Hebrews. The sacrifice instead as Christ has said in the Gospels, is to take up your cross daily and follow Him. The sacrifice for you is having already been redeemed to show what that redemption means to others. The sacrifice for you, and we are called a royal priesthood, the sacrifice for you is one that is given to glorify God in your life. It's not something we can do on our own because it's not something we can do until we recognize 
like Job. How wonderful and great God is and what he has done. And we can't do that sacrifice and we can't serve God until we recognize our dependence on him and the gratitude that we should have as he restores perhaps not our situation like Job giving us lots of benefits not that I would refuse those but rather those fruits of the Spirit, those gifts that come from the God in order to do ministry, and those crowns that we will gain once we're in heaven. Job has a lesson for us. It reminds us of how this earth is a mere shadow of what is to come. It reminds us of the glory of God and the transcendent nature of God, that same God who loves you. It reminds us that knowing God is more than knowing about God. And the joys and rewards we can get from knowing and loving Him. I'd like to say I hope you never have a time like Job where you go through such trials or where you get as angry as he did or where you want to complain to God like he did. But I can't promise that. What I can promise you is that same God that was with Job is with you now. And will love you until the end and beyond. So take joy in knowing the redemption and the life God has given you. And share that life with others. Because that's what we're to do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn to number 285 in the hymnal, Once for All.
I know that I have said this before, but this first verse, I love the words that are in there, the phrase that it uses. When it talks about, O oh, happy condition, Jesus hath bled, and there is remission. I love that word. More so in many ways than forgiveness. Because to remit something means that it's treated as if it never happened. When cancer goes into remission, that means they see no more signs of it in your body. Likewise, with sin and its stain in our lives, God's love and Jesus' sacrifice once for all causes remission of the stain of sin in our lives as God looks upon us and sees Jesus. We need to be thankful for that gift. We need to be grateful for God's grace. We need to think of God's blessings and look for them actively in our lives so that we can respond appropriately with gratitude and joy in our hearts as we give of our time, talents, and treasures to the work of God the Father and Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit here in Morning Sun. Join me in the innocent prayer of dedication. God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts. Use them, even as you use us, to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus intercedes for us with the Father we can intercede for others as well in His name. There are concerns that are listed on the back of your bulletin. I ask you to take the bulletin home with you. Look at them, read them. Pray for those people that are in, listed in there. Pray for the general situations, which we tend to skip here because we're so focused on the individuals that are concerned with the members of our church. Are there joys and concerns 
Yes. Um, uh, for the family of Angela Sutherland, uh, she was a special needs and special ed teacher over the law school, school for years, and uh, she died at 56 of cancer that they couldn't seem to get a hold of grip on. Yes, we need to pray as well for the kids. Um, that was something that was made. I was made aware of on Tuesday. Uh, it's very hard for an elementary school age child to grasp death and its impact, but especially those special needs kids she took care of. There, it's going to be a big hole in their lives. Do we have any other joys or concerns to share? You, your, what was that? It's my uncle there. He was living in the house for our family. He has a senior. He's a little girl. And then there's a very waiting for us. So, Uncle Dick is not doing well. Hospice is there. I, I think we need to pray for Cherry and Roger and all of them today that what they're going through today. And the rest of the Delzell family. Yeah, that's what we're. Yeah, Terry. Um, classmate of mine, um, morning sun girl Donna Evans, he had cancer surgery. Donna Evans, good name. H A N D. I assume it's hyphenated. She doesn't. Uh, usually, those people that mention all that have them hyphenated. An update about Vicki Hansen. She was admitted into ER at uh, Genesis East in Davenport yesterday afternoon with issues about her, I think it's pronounced pre abdomen level. But this is uh, something that she's been having issues all summer long, and we will pray that there are answers to the coming now. So Vicki Hansen? Hansen, I said. H-A-N-S-O-N? She's on the list, Vicki Hansen. Fran. And also for Amy, who is having surgery the 26th. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Amy, okay. Yeah. Okay, any other joys or concerns? Seems like once we get one going, there's a floodgate that gets opened, and that's okay. Let's pray, because God will hear them all. God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you are an awesome God. You're an awesome Father. You are the transcendent Creator who placed the stars in the sky and know them by name, who created us and knew us before we were in the womb, and yet... You have made it so that we can see you and we can know you. And not just know of you, but actually know you. We give you thanks and praise that you made that way for us to have that kind of relationship. That when we who had turned away in our sin... tried and failed to succeed to fulfill the law and righteousness that knowing our problems and our difficulties 
Jesus came and died once for all and was raised again. Let's not forget that, that He was raised again that we might have new life in Him, that we might be new creatures, that we might have a new nature. And Lord, that You would actually dwell within us through the Holy Spirit. Can't say we understand it. But we appreciate it. Give us the thankful hearts we should have. Make us aware of our need for you. We come before you in that humility, asking for your healing upon those who are sick and are hurt. Whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental, Lord, make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will. We pray for peace for Jody's Uncle Dick as he's in hospice. We pray for Donna Evans' hand and her cancer surgery tomorrow. For Amy Herrick when she has her surgery. Lord, guide the hands and eyes of the doctors in all those cases that they might have the most successful outcome possible. We pray for Vicki, who was admitted to the hospital again. And we pray, Lord, for all those families, quite a few that need that peace that passes all understanding and only comes from you. For the family of Jeep, for the family of Angela Sutherland, and all the elementary school kids that were impacted by her life. For the Delzell family, and in particular Terry and Roger, who are here in our midst. Lord, we ask that you would give them that sure knowledge that this isn't the end. That while they grieve their loved ones and that that is appropriate, may they remember your promise of the future to come. For we have been redeemed. And we will see each other once again, even as we see you face to face. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Make that time come. When every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We all recognize you for who you are. And the great sacrifice and love that you have given us. And Holy Spirit, until that day, rest upon us. Give us wisdom to understand your word and a hunger to seek it. Give us courage of heart to read through even those times in the Bible when it troubles us. Or we wonder why things didn't work out the way we thought they should work out. And give us the perseverance of spirit, not only to complete the tasks that you have for us, but to be faithful witnesses to who you are and of our trust in you. And Holy Spirit, be put out upon this church. Expand its boundaries and ministries. Keep it from evil. Lord, may it be a light in the darkness of this world. And may we be beacons of joy and of hope here. Who bring your peace to others. Who lead others to know your love and your grace and your mercy. And inspire in them thankful hearts. And joyful spirits that together we might praise your name and glorify you. And Lord, may we always seek your glory and to praise you. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the same we taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you would please stand as you're able and join me in singing number 262, I Will Sing of My Redeemer.